Good afternoon. My name is Rafael Espinal, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. I am joined today uh, by my colleague uh, and bill sponsor, Andy Cohen. Uh, today, the committee will be hearing testimony on two pieces of legislation. My bill, intro bill number 1145, in relation to creating an exception to the item pricing requirement for retail stores with scanners available for consumer use. And my colleague, Councilmember Cohen's bill, intro bill number 1181, in relation to prohibiting the use of dogs or cats as security in certain contracts. In New York City, retail stores are required to comply with the city's item pricing law that requires all products offered for sale to be individually labeled with a price sticker. The law also sets out specific exemptions. For example, provided that a shelf price is listed, products such as milk, eggs, or fresh produce, or small products priced under $1 do not have to be individually stickered. Under the definition of retail store, the legislation also specifies that this does not include stores with less than two full-time employees that make less than $2 million in annual gross sales or that primarily sell food for consumption on the premises. Over the past few years, the Council has revisited the issue of item pricing. For example, in 2011, the previous iteration of this committee held an oversight hearing on the Department of Consumer Affairs Enforcement of Supermarket Regulations after some were accused of overcharging customers. However, at this hearing, the industry voiced their concern that due to techn technological advancements with checkout and price scanners, individual item pricing was somewhat redundant. The industry also argued that due to high rates of inventory turnover, relying on price stickers may actually increase the chances of improper pricing. Similarly, last year, the city enacted my bill, Intro 436, which gives retail stores a 30-day window to remedy a first-time item pricing violation. In order to minimize the strict item pricing requirements on businesses that have become redundant due to technological advances, my bill intro 1145 that we are hearing today will provide further exemptions. Under this legislation, retailers who make price scanners available to customers will no longer have to abide by the individual pricing regulation. Under the bill, the commissioner will determine how many scanners need to be available depending on the size of the store. The second bill we are hearing today, t testimony on today is Councilmember Cohen's bill intro 1181. The growing demand for a specialized dog and cat breeds has spurred a new industry within the pet world, and that's pet financing. Under this scheme, pet stores offer customers payment plans in order to purchase their dog, cat or dog. Instead of paying the hefty price up front, usually thousands of dollars, customers sign agreements to pay a certain amount each month under the assumption that the agreement gives them ownership of the animal. However, some customers soon realize that they are simp simply leasing their pet and will not have ownership rights until the end of the payment plan. Customers have also felt blindsided by the small print within the contracts, such as if they miss a payment, their pet can be repossessed, or to gain ownership rights, they may also be required to pay additional fees once they have completed their payment plans. Councilmember Cohen's bill will prevent this practice and ensure that a cat or dog cannot be used as security in such financing agreements and therefore cannot be repossessed. Very timely for the holidays, I think, Andy. Um, we look forward to hearing from the administration, industry reps, advocates, and other interested stakeholders on these bills today. Uh, but before I call on the on the admin to, to testify, I want to acknowledge we've been joined by Brad Lander from Brooklyn and give Andy uh, a few minutes to um, speak on his bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do really uh, want to uh, voice my appreciation for your expeditious uh, hearing of this bill uh, that was recently introduced. Uh, I do think that you make a good point, uh, particularly at the holidays. Uh, pet purchase sometimes can be an emotional decision, uh, as well as, uh, you know, not, and not always. Not everyone goes into it as thoughtful and as uh, rationally as they should. Um, I know when we got our dog and we took my daughter, if we, I ch there was no changing my mind once uh, my daughter uh, uh, saw our puppy. So um, I think that this is uh, appropriate legislation. Uh, I think that we would be, if, if it ultimately passed and enacted, I think we'd be the third jurisdiction that would uh, uh, outlaw this practice. Um, and it's uh, simply uh, unfortunate the, uh, uh, the industry of uh, you know, uh, puppy retailers are often using the, the pet as security. Um, and when it's, it's a lease agreement, you don't own the pet, they can threaten to take the pet away from you, and it, when you own it, they cannot repossess it that way, but through the uh, through the vehicle of, of leasing, uh, it does give the uh, the store the, the retailer uh, greater uh, repossession rights, and people are now emotionally attached to their pet. Uh, so I think that this uh, really is a, a practice that should be outlawed. I hope that the, I appreciate the committee hearing the bill. 
and I hope ultimately we get to pass it. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Andy. With that said, uh, can you please administer the oath, please? Okay. <clears throat> uh, please raise your right hand. Uh, do you affirm to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Can you please state your name for the record as well? Casey Adams. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Espinall and members of the committee. My name is Casey Adams, and I am the Director of City Legislative Affairs for the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs. I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of DCA Commissioner Laura Lay Salas about Introduction 1145, a bill that would create an exception to the item pricing requirement for retail stores with price scanners available for consumer use, and Introduction 1181, a bill that would prohibit the use of dogs or cats as security in contracts for their purchase or the obtaining of any lesser right or interest in such animals. <coughs> DCA's mission is to protect and enhance the daily economic lives of New Yorkers to create thriving communities. As part of this mission, DCA supports efforts to simplify requirements imposed on businesses while preserving important consumer protections. I will first discuss Intro 1145, which DCA supports because we believe it will make it easier for businesses to comply with item pricing requirements without diminishing the price transparency protection th whose requirement th those requirements afford to consumers. DCA enforces two types of item pricing requirements. General item pricing, which applies to small stores like bodegas, requires that all items offered for sale show a price exclusive of tax, either by a stamp, tag, or label on the item itself, or a sign that, that is plainly visible where the item is displayed. Chain stores and stores with an annual revenue of more than $2 million must individually label each item and do not have the option to satisfy item pricing requirements by a sign like smaller stores. Specified items like milk, eggs, and ice cream need not be individually labeled so long as a shelf price and price lookup function are provided to the consumer. Penalties for item pricing range from $185 to $250 for small stores and from $18 per item to $1,000 total for chain or large stores. As Councilmember Espinal mentioned, pursuant to Local Law 5 for the year 2017, which was sponsored by uh, Councilmember Espinal as well as committee members Chin, Ku, and Kozlowitz, uh, chain and large stores may avoid paying a fine for the first item pricing violation they receive by curing the violation. Intro 1145 would exempt chain and large stores that have retail price scanners available for consumer use from item pricing requirements. Stores would continue to be subject to the shelf pricing re requirements imposed by the state agriculture and markets law. Consumers would be able to determine the price of items by checking the shelf posting or by using one of the price scanners made available to them. Intro 1145 would empower DCA to determine the number of scanners that should be made available based on store size. DCA believes that this approach will save businesses the time and cost of individually labeling items displayed for sale while ensuring that consumers can still quickly and easily view the price of items. Intro 1181 would prohibit and render unenforceable contracts for the purchase, lease, or financing of dogs or cats where the animal is used as security and may be repossessed by the seller, lesser, or lender. DCA understands and shares the Council's concern about consumers being confused by complex leasing and finance arrangements that may allow a company to repossess a loved and valued companion animal. In September, Governor Andrew Cuomo signed into law a bill that prohibits the types of contracts contemplated by Intro 1181. The bill will be going into effect in the near future. We believe this new law may address many of the Council's concerns, and DCA would appreciate the opportunity to gather more information about how the State of New York plans to implement and enforce those prohibitions. I would like to thank the Committee for the opportunity to testify today. DCA looks forward to working with the Council to ensure that 1145 protects consumers while making life easier for New York City businesses. We think the concerns underlying Intro 1181 may be addressed by changes to state law and look forward to gathering more information about their implementation. I'm now happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Casey. Uh, I usually like to allow my colleagues to ask questions first, so um, Andy. Uh, I, I do understand that the governor did ultimately uh, sign the state legislation. Uh, do you think there's any reason why uh, these two bills should be mutually exclusive or that we can't, that th as a standalone piece of legislation, uh, we wouldn't be prepared, that it wouldn't pr protect consumers? 
New Yorkers? I think DCA would appreciate the opportunity to take a, a good look at what the, at how the state will be implementing these the law that the governor signed uh, before we have the information to make that judgment. I'm going to maybe embarrass myself by my lack of knowledge, but it, what infrastructure is there on the state side in the city to for, for enforcement? So that, I think, is the question that we would like the opportunity to answer. So I, I don't think you've embarrassed yourself at all, council member. I'm with you there. Um, I think the that one of the questions that comes out of that bill is how is the state going to be Go, finding out about violations, how is the state going to be proactively enforcing, will it be proactively enforcing? I think those are all um, pieces of context that would be helpful to know um, as, from the agency side as we formulate a position on this legislation. On the city side, um, we do have, uh, we enforce other laws that regulate the, um, the types of exchanges between businesses and consumers that happen here, and especially financing. So we do have an infrastructure for enforcement that is um, that consists mainly of enforcement by our legal staff at the general counsel in conjunction with um, inspections. So in a situation like by our in inspectorate. In situations like this where the uh, violation would be contained in the contract, um, it would probably be a combination of those uh, of those two tools. Uh, can, can you think of a sort of though an analogous uh, situation where the state does do enforcement in the city on uh, consumer issues? That I, just f mm -hmm. again for my own edification. Sure, I, I can't speak for the attorney general, obviously, but they have that office has uh, broad powers to and to take action against deceptive consumer practices in the same way that the that local law empowers DCA to do so. Um, I'm not aware of uh, a, a situation that would be comfortable characterizing as analogous to here, but certainly the attorney general has broad authority on uh, consumer protection at the state level. Well, I, I'm pleased that it, it passed the state, but uh, it could be a case of belt and suspenders here, so. I do appreciate uh, you taking a look at this and trying to see if there's, again, if, there, if there's no harm, then there's no foul either in having, again, a, a belt and suspenders, suspenders approach. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Andy. Uh, we also been joined by Peter Koo from Queens. Uh, Brad, you have a question? No, no, go ahead. Bill, yeah, you're the no, sponsor no. here. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like to be, I like to make sure your, your time is up. Right. All right, well, thank you. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for being here. And you know, I'm, uh, I'm in, I've got a. I think that 1181 is looks like a good bill, and I like to sign on to it as a co-sponsor. Um, I have a few. I, I like the in concept 1145, but I have a few questions um, that I guess are you know for the administration, although in a certain way they're for the sponsor as well. I, I, you know, so um, it makes sense to me that we would not require in this day and age, you know, putting a little price sticker on every single item. Um, but I guess I want to make sure of two things, one consumer protection and, and one some worker protections. On the consumer protection side, it's my understanding now, but I don't see it in the current law, maybe it's just a practice stores do, that if you have a scanner uh, and there also is a, t a sticker on the item and there comes to be a discrepancy between the scanner, what's on the item, or what they ring you up at the register, that the customer gets the lowest of those prices um, that the store has communicated. Um, and I, I guess I, one, do you know whether that's true? And I guess in a certain way for the sponsor, would you know, that it seems to me like that would be a good protection here so that if there is a price on the shelf, a price on the scanner, a price on the receipt, and there are discrepancies that the law just makes clear they're resolved to the customers getting the lowest at price that the store told them the item was. So it's, it's my understanding that that is uh, a current legal requirement, that where there is a, a price discrepancy between what is advertised and what is actually rung up at the, um, uh, at the register, the consumer must receive the lower of the two prices. We, we're, I'm happy to, um, to discuss with you about uh, the exact underpinning of that so we can ensure that this doesn't um, impact it, but it's my mm. understanding that And just to make sure that it covers mm -hmm. what might potential internal discrepancies, right. not just like what you got. I mean, all you know, amongst all those things, if the store sent you an ad in the newspaper, gave you mm -hmm. one price on the shelf, one price on the scanner, one price on the receipt, mm -hmm. in the rare case where there's a discrepancy that they right. should give you the lowest price would be, a, that they told you the item was, that there should be a... I think we um, we absolutely agree with you, Council Member, and, and I want to also add that we we at DCA do uh, scanner accuracy checks uh, already. That's part of our mandate. 
um, as the director of weights and measures under the, under state law. So we do already send our inspectors in, and um, we we check for accuracy of the scanners. That's great. You're telling me another name for uh, Commissioner Salas is the director of weights and measures. That's right. Because I might start referring to her as the director of weights and measures. Yeah. That's a good title. <laughs> um, all right, and then my second question is about worker protections, and I, this is another, you know, on the one hand, we are, our small uh, supermarkets, they are having a hard time, and we want to do everything they can, and we don't need to require them to do work that's unnecessary, and on the other hand, we definitely don't want to expose workers to layoffs because there's less work required, so do you know whether there has been any conversations to try to you know, make sure that this is like looks forward and prevents future work from being required that's unnecessary, but in a way that does not uh, risk, you know, a reduction of work for existing workers. Sure. So certainly we share the sentiment uh, of pr that protecting workers is something we need to keep in mind whenever we're looking at regulations like these. Um, we've analyzed this mostly from a consumer protection perspective. Uh, we have not done an analysis of whether there would be a reduction in work hours, for example. Um, but I think that, in general, the, um, the industry would be better equipped to, to address that point. And I hope okay. that some of the industry's uh, members and advocates that are here today can talk to you a little bit more about how these stores actually do the work on their side to comply with the law. From our perspective, we think that the consumer protection um, goal can be met without the requirement for individual labeling, and that's why we support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Brad. Uh, Peter? Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Uh, hi, Casey. Yeah. Uh, as uh, a small business owner myself, I, uh, I like this bill 1145 a lot because uh, for small business owners, uh, it's really hard to tra keep track of all the items and and put a sticker there. Sometimes they might have stickers there, they might fall off or something. Uh, so instead of, uh, so having a scanner in the store is really good. I mean, technology now makes scanners really cheap. You know, used to be, you know, it's over a thousand dollars to buy a scanner. Now, now it's maybe a couple, a few hundred dollars, a couple hundred dollars. You can, you know, for five hundred dollars, you can buy two scanners in the store, and then customers scan before they pay. So if they are, in, you know, otherwise it's not very unfair for store owners, because every year when DCA comes, they always find something that there's no no sticker there. You know, they they stretch on the bottom on the front, you know, and and the old stickers fall off, and then they find you a hundred, a hundred or five dollars. It's very unfair, uh, and and also about the. Uh, the lower price ticket, right? You said you mentioned, and I I I noticed some the some customers they they will switch stickers, so it's not fair to the store owner that oh this is you no know, one dollar then how come you charge me three dollars no? Because sometimes people do they like, make mistakes in pricing the employees right, and it's not fair to the business owners to sell something for one dollar but it cost them three dollars to buy you know, <laughs> so mistakes. Sometimes happen. So having a scanner is, is good. Now you say, hey, you scan it. You you, you want to buy it? Buy it. You don't. If it's too expensive, you can leave it on the shelf. You know, you don't. You don't have to buy it. You know? So if there's nothing to force the uh, the store owner say, hey, you must sell this at this price. <laughs> so uh, I support this bill a lot, and I I will be uh, uh, supporting this bill. I'm going to be there. Be a co-sponsor of this bill. I think this is this bill is way overdue, you know. Uh, so uh, and and overall, you know, I like consumer affairs, but sometimes they just do oversell it. You know, when they come, because they figure, oh, I must show something when I go back. So they find something, you know. So it's very unfair uh, for small business owners to have a uh, fines, like, uh, little things, like, Oh, you don't have a, a, a price sticker, or you don't have a Show them posters, and, and, and most most uh, small business owners they want to do the job and help the people, and they want to follow the law too. But sometimes they do renovation, something move, the sign fell off, they didn't know about. Mm -hmm. So and it always happens that when you put, when you don't have the sign there, the inspectors are there to inspect you. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair Esmeral, for sponsoring. 
Thank uh, you. Sponsoring this building. Thank, Thank you, you, Peter. Thank and Councilman, I want to say that uh, we absolutely agree that most small business owners want to do the do the job, comply with the law, and help the community. And I think that there are, um, while we are charged with enforcing the law, and we're committing to do, doing that to its fullest extent, um, and to trying to motivate compliance, we certainly have gone out of our way to help business owners understand their obligations and comply, because that's ultimately what we're looking for, is compliance with consumer protection laws. Uh, we are not looking to find businesses for the sake of finding them. And I think you've seen that through our visiting inspection program, which we've talked about with you. Um, and I think we share that goal with the council, uh, which was behind Councilmember Espinal's law to make some of these violations curable in recognition of the fact that sometimes it's just an honest mistake. Thank you, Casey. Uh, just along those lines, um, I remember the first two or three years uh, of this administration, uh, there was a lot of talk about the efforts to reduce the amount of fines that are being given to businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were always numbers that were, that were presented. Do you have any numbers on, on, on what those reductions have looked like over the years? Uh, I don't have the most up-to-date numbers, but I'm happy to get them to you. Okay, thank you. Th does DCA have any data on how many uh, pricing violations it issues per year? Uh, yes, I do. So on average, um, we issue about um, 2,000 violations for the uh, violation of general item pricing. So that is small stores. Um, for the violations that are that would be impacted by these bills, over the past three years, there has been um, an average of between thirteen and uh, twelve and thirteen thousand. Um, so it is a, an area where we issue a lot of violations, and that's why I think that we are uh, we're behind the effort to achieve the consumer protection goal um, without necessity to issue that many violations. So when the agency gives gives one of these violations, that that mm -hmm. two thousand two thousand correct. Uh, 12,000. 12,000 number. Mm -hmm. That 12,000 number, it, it, do businesses receive multiple violations? Does like one single yes. business receive multiple so violations? So I'll let me, the I'd like to clarify for you because the, the way we look at violations in two ways. We look at the number of legal instruments, notices of violation that have been issued, and we look at the number of charge counts that are contained on those documents. So for the actual number of violations, notices of violation, the number is closer to 900. But on those notices of violation, the charges are closer to 12,000. Okay. Um, any any data on how many of those twelve thousand nine thousand or nine, whatever the number is, uh, how many of those were cure were curable and got cured since the law was? Um, I don't have that information, but we'll follow up with you. Okay. Yeah, that'll be that'll be interesting to see how how effective the law has been. <laughs> have you ever re do you does the agency receive three hundred one complaints from consumers about I item pricing? Um, we do. It, I, I don't believe that it's one of our uh, more significant complaint categories, but we do receive complaints, yes. Uh, how often does DCA go out to businesses to um, inspect item pricing compliance? So item pricing is part of the normal inspection routine for a general retail store um, so and a supermarket. So the, uh, the enforcement cadence is different for each category, uh, but in so as a supermarket may be visited less frequently, for example, than a bodega, depending on where they're located um, and depending on a past uh, enforcement history, because we will also go back if we find that there are, are issues in a particular place. So I can't give you a, um, a number, a, a specific time frame in which a DCA inspector will come out, because it, but it depends on a number of different factors. Okay. So what would warrant an item pricing violation? Is the, if the inspector comes sure. into a shop, if they find one item, would they, would they receive a that doesn't have a sticker on it, would they receive a violation? So there are, yes, there are different triggers. There are uh, violations for, for example, scanner inaccuracy, as I said earlier. There are violations because a stock keeping unit doesn't, because none of the uh, items on a stock keeping unit have a sticker or, or one of them. Um, there's different violations for five or more um, stock keeping items that fail to have uh, a sticker attached to them. And then, of course, there's violations for a failure to have any items, any um, prices posted at all. In addition, um, we can charge for situations, as we were discussing earlier, where there, the price is incorrect, where the, an item is labeled for $5 and you get up to the exclusive of tax and you get up to the register and they charge you 6 mm -hmm. That would also be a violation that we would issue. Okay. Um, so if, if an inspector walks into a shop, 
sees one item without a sticker, they will receive a fine of 125 to 250. Um, it it depends, mm -hmm. um, but the it, it's not a typical situation where we find one item. The typically we will issue the violation for five or more, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's one of the more typical violations that we write. Okay. Does the DCA foresee any problems with customers uh, using price scanners instead of relying on the stickered items? Uh, we haven't heard so. We are aware of other jurisdictions that have gone with similar um, uh, regimes. So, for example, Westchester has a, uh, a system where stores can be apply for an exemption from item pricing if they have sufficient scanners. Um, we are not aware of problems coming from those jurisdictions. The law contemplates that we will ensure that there that each a store is installing a sufficient number of price scanners. So, larger stores will need to have more scanners. So we think that there is there's some flexibility in the law for DCA to respond to um, issues as they pop up, and certainly we'll be on alert for those. But in general, we think that consumers are well acquainted with the process of using price scanners. They're fairly common, um, and we, um, we will be on the lookout if any issues do come up. Mm -hmm. All right, great. We've been joined by Karen Kozlowitz from Queens. Do you have any questions, Karen? Um, I was <coughs> I was in the council when this was put into law. I happen to be a sponsor of this bill, mm -hmm. and I'm not for the scanners because I run into a supermarket. And many people like me run into a supermarket. They don't want to run around looking for scanners to scan their items, and also it it lessens the amount of people that they need to work in the stores mm -hmm. because you're putting people out of jobs because so you don't need those people to go and and hit the cans with the prices i think that w it's important to remember um that the shelf pricing requirements in the agriculture and markets law will will not be changed by this so uh, when we talk about item pricing in terms of this law, we're talking about the stickers on the individual items. And I understand yeah. that. So I, I did item mm -hmm. pricing is my bill. Right, and but for for consumers, uh, they will still have the opportunity to see the price on the shelf below. Um, so they, the the hope is that there there will be no need to run around the store because the consumer will have access to that price um, to that price label. And if they don't, then that in itself would be a violation of the law. Well, how will you know unless you scan the item? Mm -hmm. if, if the item pricing is on below mm -hmm. the item and uh, you do the, and the can doesn't have the price, mm -hmm. how will you know? Well, the, the, when the item, the item pricing that happens at the shelf level has right. to refer to the item itself. So we would be able to see what store, what price the store is labeling the shelf uh, at and we would be able to test the accuracy of the scanner. So to go to this, take the item to the scanner and check whether that's actually what's being charged. And the state law requires that the um, the, pr the shelf price be below or immediately adjacent to the item that it's um, that it's marked for. So if if we were not able to tell, then that again would be a violation of the law because it would not they would not have made clear to the consumer which shelf price applies to that item. I'm not very sure on this, that this is a good thing. Oh, well, we are, um, you know, we, we believe that <coughs> the that consumers will be able to use price scanners, that they're already in the practice of using it. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, we're happy to hear if there are advocates or f from you, council member, who feel that the uh, individual price labeling yields other benefits from our experience enforcing. We believe that um, that consumers are well acquainted here and that the, uh, the benefit to consumers that is yielded from the individual price stickers um, is not as high as the cost that's imposed on the businesses of, um, of doing all of those labeling. So as a consumer protection agency, we're, we're focused on making sure that the consumers are protected, but we're also focused on making sure that there aren't unnecessary burdens placed how on businesses. How much does the scanner cost? Um, I'm, I'm not sure how much a scanner costs. I know Councilmember Koo cited a, a price earlier. Um, and I'm sure, that, and there are members of the business community who can tell you um, with more accuracy than I can. 
And what happens when the scanner goes down? The, the store would be required to keep, uh, to keep a scanner operational. <coughs> so a scanner must be available to consumers. If, there are, if there's a situation where um, one is temporarily down, that wouldn't necessarily trigger a violation, but it's the store's responsibility to meet the legal requirement that a scanner be available and functioning for consumer use. And how many scanners would be, let's say, in a store like uh, Whole Foods? How many scanners would be in that store? So the law contemplates that larger stores with more square footage would be required to have um, more scanners. So How much more? That's something that would need to be determined by the agency uh, if the law is enacted. So we would take a look at what has been done by other jurisdictions and what is the and, and try to figure out what the proper balance is between the square footage of the store and the number of scanners um, that need to be there in order for consumers to have easy access to them. Well, I would say that every aisle in the store should have a scanner. Well, we I mean, why should I be in aisle one taking something off the shelf and having to run to aisle four to ha have it scanned? I think that's definitely one approach that we'll consider, and uh, we'll take into account that, you, th that you've uh, told us that, because I think that was, um, that was one thing that people had brought to our attention, was that if we were, are doing scanners, there should be a scanner on each aisle. We will we'll take that approach into consideration when we promulgate the rule that actually sets out how many scanners uh, need to be in each store, and the price of how many scanners, and what you know what will be the savings. Yeah, I think we will definitely also be looking at the the price of the scanners because one of the other variables here is we need to understand um, how this is going to impact businesses who will now have to install new scanners, and how how much it would impact the employees of how many people lose their job because now they have the scanners and they don't punch. Mm -hmm. We hear you on that, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Andy? Uh, thank you. You know, maybe just it would give us a, a greater uh, a comfortability level. If you could just explain what the shelf pricing requirements are so that, I mean, I, I find it hard to envision myself going to scan, but at least if the price is, is marked on the shelf, I can read that. Mm -hmm. And because I'm a terror, I just, you know, when I, I go to the supermarket, the first thing I want to do is get out. Uh, so, uh, but like sometimes even I notice, wow, this is, you know, the same product or, you know, a similar product. One is $4 and one is $6. I, I notice that. Uh, but, but so maybe if you could just talk to us a little bit more broadly about what the shelf pricing requirements are so to make sure the consumers. Whether they're willing to scan or not willing to scan, we'll have a know what the price of the item is that they're buying at least at the you know when the, in front of them. Sure. So under the uh, state agriculture and markets law, the uh, retail stores are required to display, and I'm going to read. I'm reading you the provisions here. Display the retail price of each stock keeping unit offered for sale, either on each unit or on easy to read shelf tags or signs located directly above or below or immediately adjacent to every stock keeping unit or group of stock keeping units of the same brand, size, and price. Um, and, and so as I mentioned earlier, DCA is the uh, Director of Weights and Measures for the city under state law. So uh, w as I was des describing, the law imposes the requirement that that tag be easy to read and be located in a, in a way that is easy for the customer to identify which item it's associated with. Right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Casey. Thank you. Up next, we have Brendan Sexton from UFCW Local 1500, Ed, Edgar Lombardi from RWDSU, and Alex Gleason from CLC. You guys may begin. You want to go first? Sure. Oh, you go. Oh, 
Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Brendan Sexton. I'm the director uh, of organizing, political coordinator uh, for United Food and Commercial Workers, Local 1500. Thank you, Chairperson Espinal and the other committee members uh, for this opportunity to speak on intro 1145. With over 19,000 members, Local 1500 is one of the largest locals in the UFCW and the largest in New York State. Our union represents men and women in New York City, along with Nassau, Suffolk, Westchester, Putnam, and Dutchess counties. Our members work for companies that have a long history in New York City. Companies such as Stop and Shop, Fairway, King Cullen, ShopRite, D'Agostino's, Gristides, and the workers at the Helen Hardy Commissary. Our members have earned better salaries, better benefits, and most importantly, job security because of the hard work Local 1500 has done negotiating over the last 80 years. After careful review, we have concerns over intro 1145. The, the quest to remove a consumer protection should not be taken lightly. The truth in pricing law is specifically designed to protect consumers from unscrupulous supermarket operators. We have seen time and time again the low road retailers manipulate prices to benefit themselves and not the consumers. Having access to clearly marked items is essential to consumers. Average New Yorkers often must make tough economic decisions, sometimes coming down to the nickels and pennies. Why would a piece of legislation make this process more difficult? The bill is unclear to how the appropriate number of scanners will be determined. Also, we have concern over the ambiguity of enforcement. Will it be through a complaint system or through monthly inspections? In New York, there is a justifiable revolt against Amazon and their community and labor practices. We are thrilled that so many of you and your colleagues are standing up against bad employers. But with intro 1145, the council will be codifying job loss. We will never advocate for automation to replace our members' jobs. As we all watch Amazon being exposed for automating and decreasing overall jobs, why are we trying to replace workers with automation? We should be trying to create more jobs and economic growth instead of hindering it. Operators will say that it frees up workers to be more productive in other areas, making the store more profitable, therefore creating more jobs. When bosses talk about being more productive, that's dog whistle for reducing hours and weekly wages. Over time, uh, more jobs will be lost through attrition than actually created. For the 19,000 members of UFCW Local 1500 to support any exemption for item pricing, we would expect the following to be included in any bill. A clear de definition of how many price scanners per S uh, SKUs in a location, a clear definition of price scanners, and to clearly remove cash registers as a price scanner. The enforcement process will be consumer complaint or monthly inspections should be defined. And one of the requirements to be eligible, a supermarket operator must be considered a high road employer, meeting or surpassing these guidelines. Living wage and benefit packages broken down between part-time and full-time work reported monthly and made public. Stable scheduling. Job training for advancement. Either a signed CBA or a signed labor peace agreement with a relevant union and a sign off from a rel relevant union as well. Protecting consumers and jobs can go hand in hand. If we, are, if, we, if we are to allow an exemption, it should be a privilege bestowed upon responsible employers and not supermarket operators that model their business practices on the Walmarts and the Amazons of the world. With the amount of questions and ambiguity, we would recommend that a more robust conversation take place with all the stakeholders to ensure consumers and workers are not negatively impacted. We encourage the committee to vote no on intro 1145. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you to the chair and the committee for the opportunity to testify today on intro 1145, which amends the city's truth and pricing law. My name is Edgar Laborde. I'm here on behalf of the Retail Wholesale Department Store Union, RWDSU, which represents 100,000 members, including 7,000 members of RWDSU Local 338. These members live and work in the city of New York and are employed at over 130 food retail establishments, including Christides, Martin Williams, Stop and Shop, Associated, Food Town, and other small specialty and gourmet shops. RWDSU stands opposed uh, to this uh, legislation as written. The legislation will result in the direct loss of jobs at grocery stores throughout the city. Our members are responsible for ensuring the accuracy of pricing and tagging of items sold in our retail locations. Grocery and supermarket operators regularly state that these, clerk can be, these clerks can be utilized in a more productive and efficient manner. However, this, efficient, th this efficiency often translates to a reduction of hours and thereby a reduction in workers' weekly wages. Many of our local officials have stated that they find the use of technology to replace workers irresponsible and they've taken a stand against it. This was particularly evident during the recent discussions around Amazon's impact on the local workforce. 
Intro 1145 is simply another attempt to supplant grocers, grocery clerks. The intent of the current truth and pricing law is to ensure that cons consumers have access to clear and precise pricing. We are concerned that this amendment would have several unintended consequences above and beyond job loss. The City Council should engage again with the Department of Consumer Affairs prior to this passage to ensure that there are no additional unintended consequences for consumers. As written, there's no clarity on how many scanners retail retailers would be required to have, as well as what constitutes a scanner. Without individual pricing, what happens if a scanner breaks? What happens if a scanner is being used by others? Would a shopper, upon entering a store, take a scanner for their entire shopping experience uh, and use it uh, to scan every item they seek to buy? How would the city then ensure there are enough scanners in each in such a, an event? In the likely event that a consumer could find a scanner, that person would be left to wait in the checkout line to determine a price. This is unreasonable, and this is a burden, and the point of sale should not uh, be the adequate means for price checking. The bill also does not adequately address the enforcement of the scanner exemption. We do, we do not know, it, we do know if inspections to verify compliance with the accurate number of functioning scanners occurs randomly or if it will solely be based on complaints received by DSA, DCA, excuse me. We are worried that intro 1145 leaves several uh, unanswered questions around implementation and safeguarding basic consumer protections. New York City offers retailers the opportunity to access item pricing waivers. We understand the burden that traditional brick and mortar retailers are facing due to the increased competition from online retailers and the changing nature of the industry. Yet, these burdens should not be borne by hardworking grocery clerks. The City Council has long been a champion of neighborhood grocers and the women and men employed in the industry. Supporting this bill would be taking a step backwards on the needs of grocery store workers. Moreover, any program that offers a direct benefit to grocery and supermar supermarket operators should also focus on how to prioritize the needs of high road retailers who are good community partners that meaningfully invest in their workforce, either by abiding by collective bargaining agreements or offering living wa wages and benefits. We urge you to, f to fully consider the impact that this proposal will have on workers, consumers, and brick and mortar stores that invest in their workforce and vote no on the proposed amendment. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Alex Gleason. I'm the Director of Policy, Research, and Legislation at the New York City Central Labor Council. Comprised of 1.3 million members uh, across 300 affiliated unions, the New York City Central Labor Council, AFL-CIO, supports policies that lift the floor for workers across the five boroughs. The Central Labor Council appreciates the opportunity to testify on intro number 1145, an exception to the item pricing requirement for retail store workers with scanners available for consumer use. Our affiliates, representing tens of thousands of workers across the retail food industry, have expressed concerns over this bill and the implications on the entire industry's workforce. Concerns stem from the consequences on the workforce, precise pricing information, and the enforcement of the law. There are there are concerns the proposed exemption on employees in this legislation will adversely affect the workforce. A recent report by Cornerstone Capital finds the retail industry, and grocery stores in particular, to be at high risk of computerization. This echoes the sentiments of an analysis by McKinsey and Company, finding automation in many forms is slated to disproportionately impact the retail grocery workforce. It is very likely the reduced demand for workers will lead to a reduction in hours. This is consistent with analysis published in the peer-reviewed Journal of Industrial Economics, which found stores utilizing scanners, quote, reduced their, in brackets, employer labor costs by approximately 4.5%. For our members and workers in this industry, this reduction in labor costs is a diminishment in livelihood. Another concern relates to accurate pricing information for the consumer. The intent of the truth in pricing law is to protect New Yorkers from inaccurate or deceptive pricing policies. 
Reports from other localities where scanners have proliferated retail shops found consumers being overcharged at a myriad of different retailers, where price differentials from scanner to register varied between 20 cents and $5 above the list price advertised or charged at the register. This is from a very radical news source, ABC News Philadelphia. The title of the story was Scanner Scandal, Prices Changing from Shelf to Register. The other here issue here is how the law will be enforced. It does not seem clear how there will be verified compliance on accurate numbers of properly functioning scanners. Will it be random, based on complaints, or something entirely different? It is important for there to be clarity on exactly how many scanners will be required, as well as what can be classified as a scanner. Our affiliates in the industry recommend exempting point of sale, so consumers aren't forced to wait in line to check the price of an item. The New, York City Central Labor Council has long support, uh, the New York City Council has long supported working people of the retail and grocery industries, and it is understandable the Council would want to provide support to businesses under significant economic stress. However, any effort to support the retail industry should support high road actors and not be balanced on the backs of workers' hours. Without the concerns of workforce reduction, symmetric pricing, and enforcement being addressed, the New York City Central Labor Council, AFL-CIO, urges a no vote. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Any questions from my colleagues? Brad? Um, uh, let's see, I think it was Brendan, in your testimony, amongst the things you mentioned uh, as high road employment was uh, stable scheduling. Um, as you know, that's something the council has taken up in other sectors. And so I just wonder, I guess I'm assuming that in any store covered by a, a CBA, there is uh, advance notice and stable scheduling provisions. But do you know if in non-union stores in the industry that the kinds of things that we you know, heard in other retail and in uh, fast food are also a problem in green markets, grocery stores, small supermarkets? Yeah, so uh, supermarkets that don't have a uh, collective bargaining agreement in place, uh, they often have their schedules posted, but they then get manipulated. They get changed. Uh, you know, when 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 a store is slow, they send people home. They'll have people travel down to work and then send them home if if there's not enough business. Uh, they'll change people's days off. They'll add people onto the schedule without notification. Uh, so yeah, the, it's pretty rampant within the grocery industry. Okay, uh, and that's something you know. I mean, that I and you know, I see you suggesting here would be like a requirement for someone on item pricing. We could also just look at doing it in the way we did for fast food workers and that retail workers that the governor did by the wage board order um, could be done for the supermarket and and grocery store industry for all those workers to have fair work week protections. Yeah, I, I think the the reason why it was included was just to show um, a that it's a good operator. Um, and it's just showing that, that they're in good faith, that they're actually going to be partners with the workers and, and good community partners. So that's just a definition yeah. of what a high road retailer is. So, yeah. you know, I'm in, I'll, you know, I'll, I mean, I'll, we'll follow up, I'm sure, on these issues you're raising in your testimony, but I'll follow up with you afterwards, you know, sep you know separately on whether that might be something that we should look at industry, industry wide. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Brad. Uh, we have been joined by Margaret Chin. Can you warm her hand? So I have, I have a question, um, or maybe a suggestion, or maybe trying to get your thoughts on something. So I, I hear your concern about the workers. Um, the intention of for me to you know have a hearing on this bill is figuring out ways we can lower the amount of punitive fines against against the businesses, right? Um, what if what if scanners were put in as a as like a form of protection in case there are some there are some items that weren't marketed uh, where it weren't uh, tagged properly, for example, as BCA mentioned, that if they find more than five items that haven't been marked, what if they had this if they had this machine, uh, the scanner up, up, they could avoid getting a fine. And Does I'm that sorry, make sense? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. And that would still include the, the item pricing on the actual individual item. Right. So it's kind of a form of protection, meaning if if for some reason a BCA finds more than five items that do not have the sticker on it, that because they have the scanner up, that somehow it will protect them from receiving an item pricing violation. Okay, the, the, the operator. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's something that we could definitely talk about and think about. Um, you know, the, the as long as the consumer and the workers are protected, I, I see why not. But that's something that we definitely bring back and talk about. Up next, we have 
Andrew Wasserman from Fairway Market, Nelson Eusebio from uh, NSA, Jay, and sorry if I mispronounced your name, just having trouble reading some of these, uh, Jay P Peltz from the Food Industry Alliance. Michael Michael King and Lawrence uh, Mandelker. You guys, you may begin whenever you're ready. Hello, is it on? Okay, great. Good afternoon. Chairperson Espinal and members of the committee. I'm Lawrence Mandelker. I'm a country lawyer trying to make my way in the big city. <laughs> I represent NIMRA, the New York Metropolitan Retail Association, an organization of national chain retailers with stores in the city. Thank you for providing us with an opportunity to discuss this bill with you. NIMRA's members are retailers. <coughs> Retail is the fourth largest source of jobs in the city, following financial services, health care, and professional technical services. But our jobs are open to all without years of training and certification, and no barriers preventing a stock clerk from rising to the highest levels of management. Over the past number of years, the city has imposed many requirements on us, each worthy from a public policy point of view, but each bearing a cost. All of the city's taxpayers, all of your constituents, are our customers. We are forced to operate on small profit margins that are sensitive to every cost and expense that government and the market impose on us. We either have to pass the cost on to our, con our customers or lay employees off in our brick and mortar stores and increase online operations. We've been warning about this for years and it has now come to pass. What a pleasure therefore to support adoption of intro 1145. The bill would exempt retail stores from the item pricing requirement of the truth in lending pricing law where consumers have access to in-store price scanners. Stores qualifying for the exemption would be relieved from the cost of labeling or tagging the price of each item individually. individually. Instead, retail stores would provide a barcode on the item which consumers could scan to ascertain its price using an in-store scanner. The number of scanners would be based on the size of the store as determined by the Department of Consumer Affairs, which is directed to promulgate implementing regulations over the 120 days prior to the bill's effective date. NIMRA supports intro 1145 and is grateful for the chair's understanding of the difficulties brick and mortar retailers face in competing with online marketers. Your willingness to relieve retailers from the burden of unit pricing through the use of readily available technology. I mean, we are now approaching the third decade of the 21st century. Technology that will protect consumers is much appreciated. NIMRA does have 
one operational issue with the bill. As presently drafted, the bill would take effect 120 days after adoption. Most respectfully, that is too short a time. In preparing to testify, I reached out to the various operational people uh, in the Nimmer chain, uh, the, the Nimmer chain stores. We have been advised that our members would need at least a year to go through their respective internal budget allocation processes for selection and procurement of in-store scanners, determination of the best places in a store to install them for both enhancement of the shopping experience and providing consumers with the information they need, <coughs> and adoption of policies and provisions of employee training. We therefore recommend that the bill's effective date be pushed back to one year. Thank you. Good morning, Chair. Good afternoon, Chair Espinal and other members of the New York City Council Committee on Consumers Affairs and Business Licenses. My name is Nelson Eusebio. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the National Supermarket Association. I'm here today to testify on Intro 1145, which will create an exception for the item pricing requirement for retail stores with scanners available co for consumer use. We would like to commend Council Member Rafael Espinar for taking a meaningful and comprehensive look at the existing business climate for grocery stores. It's no, in, it's no secret that the industry is in crisis. With local grocery stores closing their doors regularly and leaving neighborhoods devoid of uh, healthy food options due to financial hardship, creating an extension for item pricing requirement will eliminate one of the biggest fines in this industry. While scanners are available and shelves are properly marked, grocery stores still must find time to individually mark each item to avoid huge fines. Managers must find time for an employee to mark every item, which can be very time consuming. This bill will allow managers to utilize employees' time better for more efficient uses around the store. I'd like to clear up any misconception that the elimination of this burdensome regulation will in no way cost hours or jobs. It will simply save our businesses from enormous fines and make our employees more efficient, which benefits everybody, including the consumer. At a time when businesses are struggling in New York City with high rent, burn regulations, and most recently with the challenge of losing business to online retailers like Amazon, this bill will provide much uh, relief to local grocery stores. It will also provide a show of faith for the local brick and mortar business and let them know that the city has not forgotten them. Um, i just just like to add that I'm a former clerk at, at, at supermarket, and I grew up as a child working in supermarkets. And one of the most tedious things that we had to do was item price, can by can. Um, I believe that most of the clerks throughout New York City are going to stand up and cheer the day that this bill is introduced because they won't have to do this chore anymore. Also, the burden for uh, a, a young man or an immigrant making sure that he prices these cans goods right is relieved from them. The burden now is more on the manager of the store or the owner of the store that the equipment is working properly, not on the poor store clerk who usually gets the blame. And who is the person, unfortunately, uh, as we might not want to hear it, but 99% of, of item pricing is done by a clerk who marked the wrong price. Not intentionally, but by human error. And it's that clerk that carries the burden when the item price is wrong. He must tell his manager, it was my mistake, boss, sorry. And this can build up on, on his person. Clerks are going to be relieved that they don't have to do this anymore. And if we put the scanners on every aisle, that's going to create more jobs because now there's going to be more people checking the scanners. Scanners have created also jobs. We have jobs in the office now where you have a girl constantly checking to the computer. You have people on the floor going, uh, uh, making sure that everything has the proper uh, UPC code on it. Uh, most clerk jobs are entry level. You hire people who just recently came from another country or with a, a high school education. For them, I think a burden will be lifted from their job. Thank you. That's not going on. Hello? Oh, now we're on. Good. 
sorry about that. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Intro 1145. My name is Jay Peltz, and I'm the General Counsel and Senior Vice President of Government Relations for the Food Industry Alliance of New York. FIA is a nonprofit <coughs> trade association that advocates on behalf of grocery, drug, and convenience stores throughout the state. Neighborhood grocers have never faced a more difficult operating environment. Operating expenses are increasing as rents soar, health insurance premiums rise, and the minimum wage reaches $15 an hour on December 31 of this year. Non-traditional retailers that are largely non-union, such as internet sellers, warehouse clubs, natural and organic stores, and dollar stores, are taking market share from neighborhood grocers. These circumstances are making it increasingly difficult for neighborhood grocers to net even a penny on the dollar. Accordingly, a rationalization of the regulations governing the city's food retailers is long overdue and in everyone's best interests. This reform bill is a great example of such rationalization. Since store-level computerization began in the 90s, more than 20 years ago, this is not a new thing, item price files have been sent to stores on a weekly basis, which allows stores to update prices in real time. This means that item marking has no value. The item prices are clearly displayed on easy-to-read monitors at checkout. The computerized pricing systems are fully integrated so that shelf tags required by state law and price signs are generated with the item price files that are sent to the stores. The technological upgrades allow the city's neighborhood grocers to comply with state, and unit, to, with state unit pricing and price accuracy laws. The city's grocers spent millions implementing these systems over the last 20 years. Yet the city still requires the food retail industry to spend additional millions over time to mark thousands of items by hand, even though accurate prices are already disclosed to customers, and to pay fines for violating the arcane item pricing law. These fines are unfair because even a grocer that makes a good faith effort to comply with the city's item pricing law will make mistakes while trying to mark thousands of items in a store, thus guaranteeing that fines will be paid even if 95% of the items in the store are marked accurately and there are accurate shelf tags and price signs in front of unmarked items. None of the foregoing, redundant disclosure of accurate price in information through integrated computerized price systems as well as state unit pricing and price accuracy laws existed when the city's original item pricing law was enacted. These developments caused the state to allow its statewide item pricing law to expire in the early 90s, more than 20 years ago, allowing localities to decide whether item pricing should be mandated. The vast majority of New York's municipalities chose not to require item pricing. Accordingly, the city policy is an expensive, unnecessary outlier. <clears throat> now, there was talk about how, um, that, how the, the sh shifting labor dollars from unproductive to productive uses is somehow a dog whistle. Nothing could be further from the truth. The reality is that payroll in grocery stores is a function of average weekly sales. So if average weekly sales are a half a million bucks and the payroll percentage is 10%, the grocer will spend $50,000 a week on payroll, which yields a certain number of hours. That formula is not affected in any way whatsoever by this bill. You need a certain number of hours to service the business in the store, otherwise you lose customers, particularly because they're losing share uh, constantly to all these non-traditional retailers. The second point is that item significant item pricing reform has been enacted by all of the city's surrounding jurisdictions that had sort of a pure item pricing law in Nassau, Suffolk, Westchester, Mount Vernon, and in none of those jurisdictions were jobs or hours cut because of the item pricing law. The stats that you heard before, uh, they never spoke to the reason for the cuts. The cuts had nothing to do with item pricing laws. The cuts were about uh, average weekly sales. Um, so in light of our testimony, uh, we enthusiastically support uh, Chairman Espinal's bill. We thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your thoughtful leadership on this issue, and we'd be ha happy to answer any questions that you might have. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair and Committee, for allowing me to testify here today. My name is Michael Kim. I, I am the Director of Government Regulatory and Retail Services for Crasdale Foods. I'd uh, just like to make a couple of quick points. Um, the way stores operate now that do have item price exemption, they are checked quarterly on a regular basis for item price exemption. And dependent upon their accuracy, it goes down from there. So it starts off with quarterly, then goes uh, every six months, then um, yearly after that and, and so forth. Um, as far as jobs being lost, there, I, I don't believe there will be jobs that would be lost. I believe it will make employees more effective and more productive, and I believe it would actually produce jobs because in order to maintain an effective and accurate system, someone does have to run it. So dependent upon the size of the store, 
usually it's one or more people to do it. Thank you. So we'll be happy to answer any questions. Andrew Osman is here from Fairway. He's here to show his support and answer any questions you might have. He won't be testifying. All right. Thank you. Uh, colleagues? Karen, then Brad. <coughs> I'm a shopper, a food shopper. They just closed the supermarket across the street from me. I love Fairway, and in order for me to go to Fairway, I have to get in the car and go probably five miles to go to a fairway. The store that closed had to do not with high rents. It had to do with stale food, stale milk, and that's why they closed, because people stopped going there. I am forced now to go online, deal with Fresh Direct, Peapod, which is owned by Stop and Shop. So it's not the store owners that are going away because of the high rents. It's because people stop going there. I have key food in my area. I would say most of the grocery stores in my area, and I, my area is Forest Hills, Rico Park, and Kew Gardens. <coughs> Most of them aren't clean. And that's why they close. And a lot of supermarkets are closing. Key foods are owned by individuals. They're not owned by a conglomerate. They're owned by individuals. And I think these people have not been checked on. I don't know how often Consumer Affairs goes out to check on the food or the health department goes out. But that is why the supermarkets are closing. Not because of no business, because the supermarket across the street from me has a huge population of senior sen seniors. And no, now those seniors have no place to go. They would have to walk maybe 10 blocks to the closest supermarket. They just demolished my key food. It was bought by a builder who's building. I am dying to get a supermarket into that development. And nobody wants to come. I, I, it's, it's funny you should mention that particular store because I happen to be a member of ours. In that particular store, the developer the refused the to deal the with the store owner and uh, they didn't want him there because he was going to build on it. So the reason that he left was because the developer didn't want the supermarket. He wanted to rent it out to a higher renting identity. The, the store owner wanted very much to stay there and was willing to invest millions of dollars in that location, but the landlord told him no. So uh, why, didn't, why didn't he? Why did he wait for? He could have invested the millions of dollars before well, the... No, no, because when you have a lease and your lease is up in three or four years, and the landlord refuses to resign that lease, then you can't make the, the investment to the store. But I am telling you that store was dirty. It was absolutely dirty. I, I bring items up to them because they're old. They're old on the at shelf. The end of the day, Milk. At the end of the day, the store went out because the landlord refused to give them a new Who? lease. That, that's, but I'm that's just the saying thing. the stores aren't being ma maintained. Who, who takes care of that? The city does a very good job at that. I don't agree with you. I really do not agree with you. Well, he went out because of his landlord. That's the, that's the bottom line. That's a fact. You can check that out. It's not me saying it. I will, it. I will it's a check fact. it out. Check it out. I yeah. will check it out. Yeah. He went out because the landlord refused can, to renew his lease. But he can come back because the landlord. No, 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 he won't. The landlord, no. He, He's going to give charge. it to a national chain that's going to pay four times the amount of rent that he was paying. And you can also look that up. That is a fact. Right now, he has nobody. That's the situation that we're going through in the city of New York. They'd rather have nobody and wait for a national chain to come in and pay them three or four times the amount of money that these individual stores are paying. This is what we're living in New York. 
That's why we need this relief. So well, what, what would that have to do with the supermarkets being clean or not clean? Well, it would give the time to the store clerk maybe to clean up the store when he doesn't have to add them price can by can by can. I'm sorry, I don't agree. Well, I'm a former store clerk. I can tell you it is a fact. I mean, the reason this item pricing was put into effect was because of this problem beforehand. I've dealt with the food industry for over 20 years. Item price has been in effect as long as supermarkets have been around. When scanners were introduced, that's when the industry thought the item prices was gonna be relief. That's the whole idea about scanners. So we don't have to mark item by item. But item pricing has been around since the invention of supermarkets. So, uh, so poorly run stores aren't going to make it and we're not defending that. Uh, but I've been around the business for decades. So what happens is if a store is poorly run, there's an opportunity for another independent operator. And they will buy that store as a value play and turn it around as long as they can get a lease. If they can't get a lease and they can't make the landlord provide the lease, they're not gonna put up millions of dollars to buy a store and renovate it and operate it properly when they don't have enough time left on the lease to make their money back and earn a return. And, and the context is uh, the regulatory burden. So what we're, what we're asking is that the city rationalize the regulatory burden wherever possible so that everybody wins. And that's what we think this bill will do. Well, I think this still needs a lot of adjustments. If, if you don't mind, I'd just like to comment. I'm not a supermarket person. I'm a department store person. Nimra is department <laughs> stores. And the reason that I wanted to comment because your comments about how these stores are not being maintained properly and not being kept up properly. We in the department store industry are under attack by the online marketing industry. And so we're trying to figure out how do we get people to come into brick and mortar stores. And if you look at the advertising that's on the TV and you read the advertising, in the uh, papers, and if you go into the department stores, you see that they have rearranged the department stores. They try to give much more service to the customers. They try to make each department store a fulfillment center. They try to put the workers who are there and to give them more duties and to hire additional workers so that they can improve the customer experience. Supermarkets, department stores, we're not in the business of having dissatisfied customers. We're in the business of trying to satisfy customers. When you have constituents, when you are dissatisfied because your store was not kept up and, and, and is gone. That's something that affects you, but it affects all retailers because we want satisfied customers. There is a total, total compliance, I shouldn't say compliance, <coughs> confluence between elected officials who have constituents and retailers, whether it's supermarkets or department stores, who want satisfied customers. We all want the same things. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we had a comment over here. Yeah, it is, I just wanted to um, just give us a good idea. Um, food service establishments are inspected yearly by the De U.S. Department of Agriculture and Markets, provided that they pass their inspection. If they fail their inspection, they are reinspected within 30 days. Um, so, and Department of Agriculture Markets does a very good job and they are very thorough in their inspections of the store. Um, also, one of my jobs too is I am also a food safety professional licensed, so um, that is one of my jobs to provide backup to a lot of supermarkets that do fail their inspection and everything and go in and make sure that they do pass. A year is a long time. Um, I do not make the rules, we just have to follow them. A year is a long time. Thank you, Karen. Brad? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, um, 
So first, thank you all for being here. I think like everyone else on the panel, I am eager to make sure that in a difficult retail environment, we do what we can to preserve and strengthen and support uh, brick and mortar retail. Um, I worked closely with a lot of you guys to try to make sure we came up to a, for, with a solution to the plastic bag issue that would actually work for the retailers. Um, and um, in a recent pro uh, project in my district, not unlike the one Councilmember Kozlowitz uh, describes, worked very hard to get a developer to commit and work with the community to restore a supermarket into a, into a development. And, you know, whatever, we're all aware of Amazon and everything else. So I'm sympathetic. And I think there are ways in which, you know, the relief from item pricing uh, can be done in ways that protect consumers uh, and make sense for New York. Um, but I want to ask about the, the question for workers, because it may be true on the one hand that they don't enjoy uh, putting every individual sticker on every individual can. And it may be true that it, it creates work that uh, we might decide doesn't need to be done. On the other hand, for folks who have jobs doing it, it is their livelihood. It's how they pay their rent and how they pay their food. And I don't want to do something that's going to cause people to lose their livelihood, even if we conclude that it's work that was not necessary anymore. So I did notice in the NSA testimony that you say uh, it will not cost hours or jobs. And I guess in a different way, Mr. Peltz, you said the same thing. So would you be willing in some form, and I don't know whether this would look like something in the legislation or whether it would look like something in terms of uh, you know, uh, signing something with the, with the worker organizations that provided us with some certainty, with some comfort that workers were not going to lose their jobs. Obviously, over time, there might come to be a reduction of some 5 or 4% or something in hours. Um, so it might be that a new worker would need to be hired less, slightly less soon. That is a, you know, that's not great, but on the other hand, it is a protect, the existing workers are the ones who I would want to make sure we're not in any jeopardy of losing their jobs. Obviously, this is different where there's union agreements and where there's not, but what could you, you know, that's just, I think, a real concern we would have here, and I, it's one thing to say, don't worry, it's not going to happen. It would be another to work with us to provide some real guarantee or confidence that it was not going to happen. Each clerk is assigned to a section in the supermarket an aisle, it might be the dairy, it might be the frozen, it might be canned juice. And not only is item pricing part of his job, but he has to stack it. He has to make sure that that section is clean, that that's, that, that station is rotated, that, that the signage on that station are mm -hmm. up to date. What we're giving the uh, clerk the opportunity now is to make his area more sharp, more clean, more up to date. He's not going to be, he's not going to lose hours or job. We're giving him the opportunity to shine more. So, so then would you be willing to do something to provide the council a guarantee that there would not be layoffs of workers uh, due that to could this, be attributed due to, to this, bill? this law? Absolutely. With some clarity, you know, whatever, like that it would. Due to this bill, absolutely. Because I'm, I'm, I'm confident it's not going to happen 100%. Yeah. I, mean, I guess I'm going to ask everyone here then, you know, and I, I think it's a challenge to figure out what form that would take. Like, I, you know, I, I appreciate the, you know, I don't, I don't disbelieve what people are saying, but um, to be confident of it, I think we would want to figure out some way to, you know, to ink it. Yeah, I mean, I'd have to follow up with our members, but we're happy to talk to you about that. I mean, the irony here is that this law wasn't enacted originally to create hours. No, no, it, without it was goal not to, to create. To, to, to okay. implement consistent, I, look, and we have that through other means. And I will broadly accept that this was created as a consumer protection. <clears throat> that was the original idea, not to create work. But over time, people have come to have those jobs, and now even if we conclude that this work is not necessary, uh, it, that might be enough reason to say we don't need to hire new people to do that work. But that set of workers today have those jobs, and they need them to pay the bills. And the fact that you and I and have decided we've decided here that that work is not a, a necessary anymore is a rotten reason for someone to, to lose their job. If you don't mind, I'm going to resist the invitation to have a philosophical uh, this is very practical for me. I, I'm looking for a practical so guarantee you that, you know. No, yes. It's too early to look for any kind of a guarantee. Well, we're having the hearing on the bill. When else am well, I going to look for it? I'll tell you when else. <laughs> because this bill isn't getting adopted uh, tomorrow. Okay. If you want to sit with us 
the retail side or, or the uh, supermarket side and really explore the nuts and bolts of the assignment of labor and how labor would shift if this bill were adopted and what the consequences would be. That's something that I would uh, help to facilitate. But to sit here at a hearing without discussing this with uh, uh, the members and say, we're going to give you a guarantee, you take guarantees very seriously, as so I seem to recall. So let me leave, I'll leave it here. I mean, obviously the chair cares about the uh, employees as well. Like this is the, you know, the, it's the chair's bill. I look forward to, you know, having a conversation uh, with him uh, and I'd be glad in some form to have follow-up dialogue uh, with folks in the industry as part of that conversation. Um, I will leave room for the possibility that I could just be persuaded. It was nothing to worry about. Uh, but I guess I would just encourage you guys to leave room for the possibility that we could find a way to make, to give a great deal of confidence that it was not something to worry about. If I could just so clarify, I didn't mean to imply that we would give a guarantee. Mm -hmm. I was just saying that we're, we're happy to address these concerns and see if, you know, and see where that goes. Cool. Thank you very much. I, I guess I just have one question. Um, so what, what is the biggest concern of the sewer market when it comes to item pricing? Is it is it the the labor that that it, that it creates uh, for the worker there, or is it is it the fines that come if you don't mark, uh, properly mark these items? I'll try to explain. Go ahead. It's, it's, it's both. It's, it's labor and it's time. It's labor and it's time consuming, and and I can't say it enough. We place the burn on the clerk to make sure that that price is right. So when the department comes and gives us a fine and says the supermarket was engaging in the septic practice, that is totally false. That is some poor individual who instead of an eight saw a four and marked it down that way. By taking this burn away from him, we are relieving him of that burn. And believe me you, most clerks, all the clerks are gonna be very, very happy that they don't have to do this tedious job anymore. And, it, and in terms of the labor costs, there's two aspects of it. There's a direct cost, the dollars that you pay people to, to, to perform an unnecessary function, and there's the opportunity cost, which are all the things that they could be doing in the store that would add value and would benefit everybody. All right, great. Well, thank you, guys. Thanks thank for you. coming. Thank you. Yeah, what you said. Um, all right, so with that said, uh, this meeting is adjourned.